Illinois goes by many nicknames. Most people know it as the Land of Lincoln, but a lesser known nickname refers to the Prairie State. However, if we look at current land use, we're hard pressed to find any prairie. Most of Illinois is covered in agriculture or urban development. So what gives? How did Illinois get the nickname the Prairie State? In order to appreciate the grandeur of what the tall grass prairie once was, we have to take a trip through time and space as we explore the landscape history of Illinois and its ecology. So we've used the term enough now to warrant a definition. What exactly is tall grass prairie? Ecologically speaking, it can be defined as a diverse ecosystem dominated by grasses and wildflowers. And there were two historic forces uh, that were constantly disturbing the landscape. We had large grazing herbivores and wildfire scorching the earth black. Let's dissect this definition a little bit to really get at the heart of the concept. How shall I convey to you the idea of a prairie? Imagine yourself in the center of an immense circle of velvet herbage. The sky for its boundary upon every side. The whole clothed with a radiant efflorescence of every brilliant hue. We rode us through a perfect wilderness of sweets sending forth perfume and animated with myriads of glittering birds and butterflies. Biodiversity refers to the many different types of organisms that can be found within a given ecosystem. Throughout the growing season, the tall grass prairie is a kaleidoscope of colors, as different flowers are blooming and different pollinators are attracted to those flowers. In fact, if we were to throw a hula hoop out in a healthy ecosystem, there could be dozens of different plant varieties within the confines of that hula hoop alone. Wildfire was an incredibly important shaping force of the tall grass prairie as an ecosystem, but there are some historic discrepancies as to how those fires actually got started. Some accounts suggest that local Native American tribes would intentionally set fire to the land as a hunting practice and to improve grazing areas, while other accounts suggest that lightning strikes during thunderstorms would ignite the dry prairie grasses and fires out here. Regardless of how they got started, prairie fires would run hot. For a mile and more before you reach the edge of the fire, you were in its bright orange light, which made everything as visible as if it were noonday, and the sun was shining fiercely through a blood-colored haze. At last you gain a little rise and look beyond into such a scene as nothing but a prairie fire can show. Another piece of the prairie puzzle refers to those large grazing herbivores that I was alluding to earlier. Bison were historically prevalent here in the prairie, in herds numbering in the millions. And male bison, or bulls, were incredibly heavy creatures, weighing over a ton. These animals would eat away at the grasses and flowers. They would wallow or roll around in the mud to clean insects out of their coat and leave permanent depressions in the landscape. And they would also poop seed everywhere. So aside from being a disturbing force, they were also a major shaping force that allowed for the grasses and flowers that we see here today. There are few trees in the tall grass prairie, and for good reason. Imagine being a tiny little oak sapling reaching your way up towards the sun, only to be trampled by a big bison or scorched by a wildfire. In fact, it's impressive to think that anything could survive in this intense and unforgiving landscape, let alone thrive out here. So let's think for a moment. If it's so treacherous above ground, where is a plant to go?
prairie plants have incredibly deep root systems. In fact, 80% of the biomass or the life force of the prairie is underground in these roots. Some of the tap roots can reach down as much as 12 to 15 feet underground. Nothing can equal the surpassing beauty of the rounded swells in the sunny hollows, the brilliant green of the grass, the numberless varieties and splendid multitudes of flowers. I gazed in admiration, too strong for words. We were at times in the midst of this vast expanse of plain, where not a tree was visible. Far as the eye could reach, nothing could be seen but airy undulations and smooth savannas. Different colors will dominate the landscape during different periods in the growing season. For instance, right now we can see that yellow is a really predominant color around here. But there's always more that meets the eye. And if we look a little bit closer, we can see that there are multiple species of plant expressing these yellow flowers right now. Over here, we can look at the three-lobed leaf of a brown-eyed Susan. Whereas if we turn our attention a little bit this direction, we can feel the sandpaper-like leaf and appreciate the yellow flower here of rosin weed. Ethnobotany refers to plants and how humans were able to use them, either as a medicine or a food source. This plant here is named Rattlesnake Master and has interesting folklore relating to its potential anti-venom properties. But that's, its effectiveness is up for debate. <laughs> Here we have a plant that really lives up to the name Tall Grass Prairie. This is Illinois' state grass, known as Big Blue Stem. Another common name that it would often go by is Turkey Foot, and you have to use your imagination to get a good view of that. This fragrant plant is in the mint family. We can tell because we have a square stem here and we can feel those sharp edges on our finger. It goes by many common names such as bee balm or wild bergamot and its leaves historically were steeped as a tea. Here we find ourselves in a stand of cup plant, which has a really easy to remember common name if we turn our attention to the leaves, which are fused around the stem, almost forming a little cup. This will collect water after a rainfall and serves as a really important refuge for any organism that finds itself out in a parched prairie. This dogwood has a unique adaptation to deal with the harshness of a prairie fire. It spreads and creates a colony through its root systems, so that if the perimeter gets burned off by the harsh flames, the interior of the plant can still survive for the next growing season. This plant is called Flowering Spurge, and its seeds provide an excellent food source for upland game birds like the greater prairie chicken and the northern bob white. Here we have a plant called wild quinine. You might recognize that name if you look on the back uh, ingredient list of tonic water. This plant also has anti-malarial properties and serves as an important way to reduce the impacts of mosquito-borne diseases. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this plant. It's a common roadside weed in our area. It's known as Queen Anne's Lace and was actually brought over by European settlers as a food source. If we yank up this plant, and look at its root system, we can see that another common name for it was wild carrot. This is a food source and has since taken over our roadsides and ag fields. Prairie as an ecosystem is so well adapted to a harsh landscape that they actually need disturbing forces like fire and bison to maintain a healthy plant community. If fire is suppressed or bison are removed from the equation, 
invasive species can make their way in. These are novel plants that were introduced into an ecosystem and can wreak havoc on the health of our landscapes. They reproduce quickly and produce tons of seeds. Some examples of invasive species include reed canary grass and thistle. Modern day restoration practices include intentionally setting the land on fire, known as a prescribed burn, in order to simulate these histor historic disturbances. Let's see how quickly the Leroy Oaks Prairie responds after one of these prescribed burns. So what exactly happened to this biodiverse landscape? In a word, agriculture. When John Deere perfected the design for the self-scouring plow, it unlocked the fertile potential of the prairie soil, while also spelling the demise of the biodiversity as we know it. Before European settlers arrived, there were approximately 22 million acres of tall grass prairie in the Midwest. Today, less than 22,000 acres survive. That's less than one-tenth of one percent. All the more reason to cherish these tiny parcels of prairie that we have left. As we've seen, the tall grass prairie has a lot to offer. Grasses and wildflowers dominate a landscape once ruled by wildfire and herds of bison. This fragmented ecosystem is more rare, threatened, and endangered than the tropical rainforests, and it's right here in our own backyards. All the more reason to learn about it, care about it, and preserve it. Thanks for joining me today. We hope to see you guys on the trail soon.